Today it's known as a party town without a care in the world, but for 13 days in October 1962, Key West very easily could have been the location of the first shots of the end of the world. After the failed invasion attempt of Cuba, the Bay of Pigs in 1961, Fidel Castro asked the Soviets for missiles to defend the island. Khrushchev sees a way to benefit his country and agrees. If the U.S. can have missiles in Turkey, Soviets can have missiles in Cuba. On October 14, 1962, a U.S. reconnaissance plane flies over the island and takes over 900 photos of the countryside. These photos reveal Soviet medium-range medium ballistic missiles a mere 90 miles from American soil. This leads to an intense 13-day standoff between the two superpowers. Eight days later, on October 22nd, President Kennedy notifies Americans of the missiles and announces a naval quarantine of Cuba. He makes it clear the United States is prepared to use military force to combat this threat to national security. But the crisis is unique in many ways, one being that it's almost entirely played out between the White House and the Kremlin with relatively little input from the other bureaucracies normally involved with foreign policy. Castro has put every able-bodied man through military training. He has even armed some as young as 12 years of age. And authorities assemble thousands in cities and villages for patriotic rallies. As in the past, these rallies are designed to whip up hate of what Castro calls Yankee imperialistic warmongers. The suggestion is that a U.N. team inspect missile sites. Castro said that they had better come ready for combat. He went on to call President Kennedy a pirate for setting up the quarantine. During the tense 13-day ordeal, both Kennedy and Khrushchev are firm in their resolve and neither backing down. On October 26, Kennedy tells his advisors he fears that only a military strike will remove the missiles, but wants to give the diplomatic course just a little more time. Later that afternoon, ABC News correspondent John Scali tells White House he was approached by a Soviet agent that says an agreement may be reached. The Soviets will remove their missiles from Cuba if the U.S. promises not to invade the island country. Khrushchev sends Kennedy a late-night emotional message. In it, Khrushchev says, if there is no intention to doom the world to the catastrophe of a thermonuclear war, then let us not only relax the, focus, the forces pulling on the ends of the rope, but let us take measures to untie that knot. We are ready for this. The next morning, Khrushchev says any deal must include the removal of U.S. missiles from Turkey. Kennedy publicly responds to the first and promises not to invade Cuba. Secretly, he responds to the second and promises to remove our missiles from Turkey. The Casa Marina Hotel was taken over by the Army's 6th Missile Battalion, surrounding the grounds with barbed wire and missiles aimed at Cuba. The fear was palpable on October 23rd, as Key Westers woke up to find their military had taken over the small island. They were now living in the center of an armed encampment. The amenities of a laid-back island lifestyle were replaced by barbed wire, machine gun emplacements, and about 15,000 troops. Instead of sunbathers and sandcastles, missile batteries and other military equipment lined the beaches. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, batteries of Hawk anti-aircraft missiles are positioned here on Smathers Beach. Surrounding the launchers are soldiers in machine gun emplacements. Civilians, while fearful of the possibility of a nuclear war, are intrigued by the sights and watch intently as the soldiers go about their duties. 